Hey, good evening and welcome to our monthly meeting of the Wicomico County Board of Education. Today's meeting is being live streamed and videotaped. The videos are available for viewing at wcboe.org. As we always do, we begin with the Pledge to the Flag, which tonight is going to be led by two of our students. So if we could please rise to say the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. So thank you very much. We have with us, leading us this evening, David Dooling, who is a second grader from West Salisbury. And we also have Hosea Render, who's a fourth grader at Glen Avenue. Thank you, gentlemen. You did a fine job. of the Maryland 2A and 3A boys soccer state champions. Back in November, something extraordinary happened in athletic history for two Wicomico County high schools, for our school system and for our state. No one can recall a time when two schools from the same small community have won a state championship in the same season and same sport at two different levels. Making these state championship titles even sweeter is the fact that both teams had undefeated seasons after having only an abbreviated spring soccer season early 2021 due to COVID. The teams were celebrated as they returned home from their state championship wins, and we are glad to be able to honor them here tonight. We will recognize the teams from James and Bennett High and Parkside High in the order in which they won their state titles, starting with the team from JMB. The 3A state championship game at Loyola University's Ridley Athletic Complex in Baltimore in a very chilly nighttime game on Friday, November 19th. James and Bennett High and its opponent, C. Milton Wright High of Bel Air, were scoreless through regulation play and then through two overtimes. The game came down to penalty kicks with the Clipper kickers and goalkeeper rejoicing after taking an insurmountable 4-2 advantage on penalty kicks with goalkeeper Jack Mitchell stopping every shot and senior uh, J.P. Wright kicking in the ball that put the game out of reach for C. Mills Wright. The Board of Education congratulates the 2021 James and Bennett High Boys Soccer Team for winning the 3A State Championship and recognizes the players, coaches, and other key supporters. While Comico athletes weren't done making history at Loyola's Ridley Athletic Complex that weekend, the next day, Saturday, November 20th, it was the Parkside Rams' turn to try for a state championship. Parkside took on the Hartford Tech high team from Bel Air in a hard-fought contest. These two teams remained scoreless through the first half and much of the second half. Then with about 20 minutes left on the game clock, senior Brady Manchester scored the only goal the Rams would need to notch the one-zip victory. 
Mark Sides, goalkeepers Tyler Janeski and David Fillart split the net duties for the shutout. The Board of Education congratulates the 2021 Parkside High Boys soccer team for winning the 2A state championship and recognizes the players, coaches, and other key supporters. What an amazing season, and once again, congratulations to both of our state championship teams. Okay, 3.5 student representatives to the board reports. We'll begin with Parkside High School's Cassidy Cashman. Good evening, everybody. My name is Cassidy Cashman. I am Parkside High School student representative. I'm excited to share with you guys some of the great things that are happening at our school. We have a lot of testing coming up this month as the first semester is coming to an end, and we look forward to a great second semester. So far, we have not had to shut down any of our winter teams due to COVID, and with our next set of testing coming up next week, we hope to keep athletes safe once again. At the Parkside Holiday Wrestling Tournament last month, Parkside placed first out of 12 schools, winning by 106 points. One concern among many of the students is that, is that of having to go back to virtual learning. But we know that our administration and teachers, as well as you guys on the board, are doing all you can to make sure us students are happy and safe. Thank you again for hearing what I have to share. I look forward to next month's meeting. Thank you. From Wicomico High School, Ava Baptista. Good evening. My name is Ava Bautista, and I will be representing Wicomico High School at this meeting. Before our winter break, we held the Advanced Academic Achievement Awards on December 16th. In order to earn this award, students must have had a weighted GPA of 3.5 the first marking term while taking pre-AP, honors, or AP courses. 244 students qualified to attend, receiving a certificate in SNAP. 
We are very proud at all of, the, of all of the high achieving students at Y High and look forward to even more students qualifying next time. Our SGA also did great work before going on break. Our freshmen sold over 140 candy grams with personalized messages for their friends and family. The sophomores held a Fisher's popcorn fundraiser right on time for the holidays and racked up of a total of over $800. The seniors made wreaths, flags, and centerpieces that were completely sold out to Y High staff. Our SGA thanks all of the staff, students, and other community members who contributed. After break, the SGA has started working on their spring bingo silent auction that they have begun their hunt for local business donations. The Pot of Gold Bingo will be held on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, and tickets will start selling this month. On December 9th, the Spanish National Honor Society held inductions in the media center. With these new members, the Honor Society was able to attend the Lower Shore Vulnerable Communities Task Force outreach event, where they distributed donated children's books and clothing over winter break. Also over break, our National Honor Society members were working hard to give back to the community with the Salvation Army. On December 17th, a majority of the Honor Society went bell ringing and caroling outside of Sam's Club. Their lovely tunes were heard throughout the parking lot and even through the building walls. Their holiday cheer brought in lots of donations from the shoppers. On the 21st, the NHS spent their time distributing gifts to families through the Angel Tree Project. Even while hauling huge bags of heavy toys and trying to fit bicycles into car trunks in the cold, Y High students and alumni sang their Christmas carols and spread holiday happiness. Our theater department has resumed the rehearsals for their annual play that will take place from January 21st to the 23rd. Pucks, which is a spin-off of the cult classic Harry Potter book series, requires an intense tech week to cover all the special effects. The magical performance has a set that is fully built and we hope that some of you will join us in the audience. We also hope to see you supporting our sports team. Our boys basketball team is continuing their undefeated season and just beat Mardella 85 to 15 a few minutes ago. The girls varsity had a close game with Decatur last Thursday and they just won their game last night against North Carolina. Overall, I'm excited for what the new year holds for Y High and look forward to sharing those accomplishments with you in the future. Thank you for your attention this evening. Thank you very much. Mordella High School, Zoe DePasco is going to be with us tonight. Dr. Briggs has her report, I do believe. Thank you, Mr. Malone. Uh, Zoe just had a few quick comments that she wanted me to share. That on behalf of Mordella, they just completed their spirit week and they were happy with the large amount of participation that they had. They had Candy Graham fundraiser, which was able to raise a lot of money to support future SGA events. And they have recently met with all of their class presidents and are hopeful that this will bring more participation for future events. And that is all. Thank you, sir. James and Bennett High School, Hannah Kim.
participation and student functions, we were only able to invite those students. To further student engagement, in the first week of February, starting the new semester, our SGA is planning a student involvement week where we hope to have numerous clubs and sports advertise and advocate during lunch. We hope to encourage and increase student participation. With more outdoor fundraisers and activities planned, we are looking forward to warmer weather. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you to all the uh, student reps to the board for your participation. It's always appreciated to hear what's going on in the schools from our students. Okay, 3.6, public comment. Public comment section of the agenda is an opportunity for the superintendent and board to listen to individuals' comments on topics concerning Wicomico County Public Schools. The board chairman has the right to limit public comments in length for those concerning personnel or student matters, which clearly identify an individual or individual's appeals or legal matters that are before the board. Negotiations and topics that are more appropriately addressed in closed session or privately with a staff member. We have 16 individuals who desire to uh, speak publicly tonight. As you know, if you've been here before, we do three minutes. And I think you'll be able to see the clock up there. It's backwards for me, but it's 30, at 30 seconds, I'll say 30 seconds, and at time, I'll say time. Please be respectful of that time and, and stop as we have 16 folks and everybody wants to be able to be heard. Okay, can I just cut you off for one moment? Sure. Um, I'm getting some emails that the watching live is not working. Can we double no. check that, please? That's correct. I'm just wanted okay. to What's please not the board. I'm the live. Oh, okay. The live, it's just showing up with Thank you. Um, it's, it's, multiple bars it's of color. Bars. Yeah. We can check on that, please, before we continue. Paul, do you want to comment on YouTube? I'm showing it as live. You want, who's who's live? Well, we have people in the citizen they can't see it. Yeah, so just go to YouTube and type in Wicomico Public Schools. So we ready yeah, to go, Bob? Yeah, it's, li it's live. It's live? It is, it is live on YouTube. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, there are 16 folks, as I said, and I asked them to be put in the order that you signed up so the folks that got here the earliest get to do the public comment the earliest, so if they have to go, they can. So we'll begin with Emerson Black, and the issue is Unit 3 4. Yes, yes, sir. Good evening, board members, administration, staff, and members of the public. In a very few moments, I want to convey my sincere appreciation to the board members, administration, staff, and leaders here tonight for the opportunity to be part of this organization and to represent the members of Unit 3 for Vice President of our local WCEA. And to thank those people for the continued desire to foster a healthy and productive employer-employee relationship amid the many challenges we face together. For those who are not familiar with Unit 3 4 uh, or the vital role they take in the education process, my purpose this evening would be to take a moment of your time to promote our hardworking unit. Unit 3-4, otherwise known as our Education Support Personnel, or ESPs, is a group of dedicated, talented, and caring individuals comprised of 121 job positions that are aimed specifically at the support of, to our talented educators, administrators, and staff. 
To be, to be more specific, these members include facilities members that are comprised of operations staff who provide clean and organized workplaces at our buildings, maintenance staff who repair, maintain, and service our vital equipment, our energy staff that ensures that we have the most economical energy usage decisions, the logistics team who move furniture, and the associated support staff. Our IT department that consists of many talented and educated people who are there to implement and maintain a vast system of interconnected and advanced computer systems and security protocols. Our many nurses and our support staff that are truly frontline employees in the fight against COVID and the general day-to-day -day care of our students and staff. This is often a thankless position filled by many people who truly define the art of genuinely caring for others. The construction department who plans, builds, and remodels our beautiful buildings. We have accounting associates. We have food service workers who nourish our students even in the light of a national pandemic when our schools were not open. Our purchasing department and their staff. The transportation department who transports tens of thousands of students daily and safely to and from our schools. Our instructional assistants who work side by side with our educators daily to provide the support they desperately need. The human resources department who work tirelessly to keep order and sanity in a very complex system. In representing Unit 34 ESP employees, I'd like to express our appreciation for and the continuation of this open and meaningful line of communication between the board, the administration of the 30 seconds. WCPS, and the bargaining employees of the ESP unit concerning topics of the board. With a continued strong relationship and open lines of communication, we can continue to excel in our pursuit of the most beneficial, beneficial agreement in areas such as compensation, benefits, and work relations during this time of unprecedented inflation, uncertain supply chain issues, and a dwindling workforce availability. These actions not only empower and retain our highly performing employees, but also attract highly qualified applicants who would otherwise seek employment elsewhere. We applaud our administration for their continued diligence and remaining open to this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Valor Valerie Shear, the issue is our schools. My name is Valerie Shear. I'm sorry, I couldn't. Read my writing. <laughs> And I just mispronounced it. I'm sorry, it's Valerie okay. Shore. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Valerie Shore, and I'm a representative of the WCEA Board of Directors. Like our colleagues in Chicago, we see a huge increase in students and staff being quarantined or having to isolate, and everyone has a dire case of COVID fatigue. Waves of COVID variants shifting guidance from the CDC and health departments have been overwhelming as we anguish the loss of life, income, and stability. Still in the midst of the worst surge yet, students and staff return to our schools with mitigation strategies necessary to curb the spread of COVID supposedly in place. We re-enter our buildings only to find exponentially more students in quarantine and more and more colleagues contracting the virus. Testing, contact tracing, and appropriate masking was a struggle in the schools prior to Omicron. It's worse now. Along with the pandemic, student discipline issues plague our school, and today the parent of a student who tested positive refused to pick the student up. WCPS needs a plan in place to correct these issues in order to move forward. We need clear and immediate consequences for those who do not comply with proper masking, distancing, and hygienic practices per CDC guidelines. Disrespect and blatant disregard of the rules is intolerable. Students are destroying our building, Falling staff to student ratios cause safety and concern. What's the plan to remedy the issue? With buildings and understaffed from the beginning now suffering, dwindling numbers due to COVID, it is not possible to keep up with the demands for paper towels, soap, hand cleaners, disinfecting, sanitizing bathrooms, and high touch areas. And we have no evidence of deep cleaning. What's your plan? Despite the possibility of going to remote, our schools are not prepared. WCPS purchased a new laptop with federal funds, yet students across the county are told to wait while laptops are repaired. This can take weeks. No plan has been developed or shared ensuring that our students and staff will have connectivity. Teachers will have planning time to prepare, lessons appropriate for online, 
and support staff prepare to pivot instruction to virtual classes. When will we have a plan? Today, four tests are positive in one school with parents calling in positive tests for their children. Many must be contacted to quarantine. This scenario is playing through the country. Time and again, WCA has suggested a COVID partnership of stakeholders, including parents, teachers, and district 30 representatives, seconds. to inform and develop plans for moving forward. Why is there no plan? Thank you. Thank you. Let the clock run back. <laughs> Hey, next speaker would be Michelle Gale. The issue is our school. I can see it backwards. I got it. Thank you. Dear board members and superintendent, Dr. Hamlin, my name is Michelle Gale, and I am an instructional assistant at Parkside. I love working with my students. However, returning to in-person instruction has been very stressful. My job has become very challenging. Um, trying to keep, trying to keep myself, I'm sorry. My job has become very challenging. Trying to keep my students and myself safe, watching for mass compliance and keeping far enough apart all day long has been very taxing. Fortunately, I am in good health at the moment. While worrying about my students and COVID, I also worry about how to manage my finances. Many instructional assistants struggle to put food on the table and pay the bills. With inflation skyrocketing, it is time for WCPS to step up and increase our wages considerably. It is time to increase wages across the board to keep and reward those who are willingly to contribute to WCPS. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. Next, Joan Smith, funding slash blueprint. Good evening, Dr. Hamlin, Chairman of the Board, and Board members. The pandemic has exasperated the long-standing needs of our school system and created new ones. There is funding designed to address these needs. The Blueprint for Maryland's Future seeks to transform Maryland's pre-K through 12 education system into a globally competitive and high-performing school system one of the ways it seeks to do this is establishing a career ladder within this career ladder system, specifying qualifications and salary increases associated with levels, and including a certain minimum at teacher salary. Her legal code section 6-408 WCEA as a representative of units should be working with Whitefield County Public Schools as designated representatives to negotiate all matters of the blueprint relating to salaries, wages, hours, and other working conditions, including procedures regarding employee transfers and assignments. The structure, time, and manner of access for WCEA to new employee processing, and a career ladder for educators. By July 1, 2024, evidence that teachers in the county received a 10% salary increase above the negotiated schedule of salary increases during the period between July 1, 2019 and June 30, 2024, per Legal Code Section 6-1009. The law was written with the expectation that the salary increases for teachers occur throughout the 
2024 school year. In contract years 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022, Wicomico County Public Schools did not ask for above maintenance of effort to provide the Unit 1 salary schedule with additional increases. 30 seconds. The 10% increase per legal code section 6-1009 should be above the negotiated salary schedule. Therefore, Wicomico County Public Schools has contract years 2022-2023 and 2023-2024 in negotiations with WCEA to make that 10% adjustment happen. Time. Thank you. Next, Fred Conley, and I'll read it how he wrote his issue, Block Scheduling Again. <laughs> Chairman Malone, Vice Chairman Murray, Superintendent Hanlon, fellow board members, thank you for allowing me to speak to them. Block scheduling. Some of this is a repeat, but I still feel that it's very important. It would be very nice if a board member would ask the Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Frederick Briggs, for his assessment of how the block scheduling has gone this year. It would be nice to have that on a public forum record so we could hear his assessment, as he's the one that pushed this block scheduling in the May meeting. I'll give you my assessment once again, as you're all aware. Continue to believe that this is a complete failure on all levels. At the presentation, it was said that every Maryland school on the shore had block scheduling. That is not true. Somerset County, I understand, has abandoned block scheduling. Also, the other schools in the county do not have this so-called flex period. Board members, this flex period of James M. Bennett is for band, course, and yearbook only. There has been no other instruction, no social, whatever we call it. There's been nothing for all of those students, 45 minutes every day. They sit and do nothing. Discipline was supposed to be relaxed. The bathrooms at James M. Bennett High School, men's bathrooms, are in such poor shape that they've been locked and they are unusable. Students have taken to going outside to use the bathroom. There's videos on it. The cafeteria got pepper sprayed by law enforcement at James M. Bennett. My students were in there. They deemed it necessary. I understand the student was hauled out in a stretcher at part time. To me, this is not a better discipline situation. The four snow days that we just missed are going to be tacked on to the end of the year. First semester is not going to be extended. Take an AP calculus class, those kids are going to miss four classes that will never be made up. Semester still ending in the end of January. So we're tacking them on to the end, but we're missing classes in the beginning. Again, a big failure. Attendance, a lot of pressure. Students are going to school sick because they're afraid if they miss class, they're not going to be able to make it up. That happened at my household. I know it's happening. We've now granted teachers a mental health day once a month. We didn't need that prior to 30 block seconds. Schedule. Thank you. We didn't need that prior to block schedule. I have a senior, James M. Bennett. I spoke to a VP on separate occasions, a VP at UMES, a professor at Salisbury, and the director of admissions at Johns Hopkins University. All three of them told me the same thing when it comes to block scheduling. Block scheduling put students at a disadvantage for college application from their mouths, not mine. Please, let's do away with block scheduling. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, Matt Langford, Issue Library Books. Thank you. 
get some hacking with once in a while. He was pretty basic library system with low security shit. Not my league at all, but he had a big dick. Sometimes a girl just beats a big dick. issue is workload. teaching in Wicomico County for about 13 years. Uh, today I'd like to speak to you about some of the issues that have been shared with me by other teachers in the county concerning a lack of planning time and workload. One of the comments I've heard repeatedly from my colleagues is that the workload is becoming unmanageable. Uh, since the pandemic, there have been more responsibilities placed upon teachers than ever before. Paperwork, new programs to implement, and new technologies to learn and master. Added to this, we've experienced some shortages and increased rates of class coverage. This is certainly not the same teaching of yesteryear. And yet, planning time remains stuck and woefully inadequate to meet these ever-increasing demands. How is an educator able to do all of these things, including contacting parents, answering correspondence, working on other assignments on top of the most time-consuming activities of all, which is actually planning for instruction? All of this in less than 45 minutes a day, and you teach two separate courses, now you've got to double the prep time. Or you've got to, you have double the preps in half the time. And this is just for a general education teacher. Your planning time is less if you're in elementary school. Many elementary school teachers must plan for multiple subjects in a given day. Specialists work with different levels of students daily and must plan for each group. I had one teacher tell me that she comes to school with a colleague an hour early every day and after school is working at home until 10, 11 o'clock at night just to stay above water. And what if you're a special ed teacher? The sped teachers I've spoken to use words like, quote, unending and, quote, unbearable when describing their workload. Many are looking for other opportunities and those that have taught for a while lament that their jobs are less focused on the students. It's more about the paperwork, and they can never seem to catch up on that. Look, these are serious issues that need to change and need to be addressed. A half day off once a month 
It's like a band-aid trying to fix a severed limb. It's inadequate and does nothing to address this problem. All it serves to do is to create the appearance that something is being done. The general sentiment that has been expressed to me is that we educators and with you, the leadership, are not working on the same team. That when it comes down to it, you don't have our back. Can you blame us for thinking that? Expecting us to do more work with less time? A salary schedule that in the prime of one's teaching career is only giving a hundred dollar a year raise for multiple years? And the growing sense that the, that the last thing that you or educational leaders want to do is give us fair and adequate compensation. I guess what I'm saying is that we're all waiting to see if you truly value the contributions of the teachers to our students and to our community, or if that's just empty praise that's said in a public forum. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Darren Lombardo's issue is school issues. Good evening, board. I uh, come to you this evening to share some information with you. You may already be aware of this, but I wanted to bring it to your attention and most importantly to the attention of the public. I uh, most recently filed a FOIA request and learned that uh, $1,640 in traffic citations were paid by the Board of Education for vehicles on the road, um, school vehicles that is, and uh, to my discovery, uh, received uh, another FOIA request where I was able to identify the vehicles. And we have an issue of safety. Um, looking at the vehicles and some of our buses, uh, our, we have one bus that was uh, received a ticket for going 47 in a 30, 42 in a 30, and 48 in a 35 zone. That's three separate times. Um, that's one vehicle. Um, we have passenger vans um, doing 42 and a uh, 44 and a 30. Um, just tons of them here. Um, 43 and a 30 for a Bluebird bus. You know, when we transport our students, we always we hear that word vulnerable population. When we pick up a child, and by the time we bring them to school, which should be a safe haven. They're vulnerable while they're in transport. We need to do a better job of slowing those buses down. I see them all the time fly down the street. Um, yesterday, um, my wife passed a, 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 a three buses, uh, all three different buses. The bus drivers had their masks down like I have right now while transporting a full bus. Um, I, don't, I don't mind, I don't think they should be wearing the mask, but regardless of my opinion, um, we have a problem and a disconnect along the lines here. Um, so, school safety, we need to do a better job of it. This is not a, an attack on bus drivers or anything like that. We have our um, uh, transportation director who oversees the safety and the transport of our children. And it's dis disheartening, it's upsetting to see that two meetings ago that blocking the doorway and obstructing the parents from an open meeting was more important to him to act as a security guard rather than focus on the safe transport of our students. Um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is David Cook. The issue is SARS, COVID-19, masking, and vaccination. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> First, uh, this came up to me. I'll let you look at it. <clears throat> this is the live stream uh, for tonight's meeting. As you can see here on my phone, it is not working. Uh, on the WCBOE website, which I could pull up, but you couldn't see it, there's no mention of the live stream being on YouTube. So that is more obfuscation by the board. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, vaccination. So 
I am no fan of uh, vaccination unless it's prescribed by one's medical doctor. It's not our business to get into other people's medical business. Therefore, I would highly encourage the board not to run the vaccination clinics in our schools. If a child or his parents wants them to get vaccinated, by gosh, they can take them to their pediatrician. <clears throat> Mask choice, ASAP. Per Comar, local boards have the power to lift mask mandates. Three circumstances, 80% of staff and students are vaxxed, vaccinated. 80% of Wicomico County citizens are vaccinated. Or, <laughs> the transmission rates in the county are low or moderate for 14 days. I don't know, I, I might have a different definition of low or moderate than you do. But I just assume get these kids being able to see one another's faces again. <clears throat> I think it's important for their social development. All right, I gotta get moving here. In light of recent uh, information on the news, 75% of COVID deaths were patients with at least four other comorbidities. Recovery rate is 99%. Vaccinated and unvaccinated alike are contracting SARS-CoV-2. Lastly, at the last evening meeting over on Long Avenue, I witnessed an assault on a member of the citizenry by a board member, and I'm not happy about it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is Andrew Hay. The issue is kids not at grade level. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for holding the um, meeting here. I'm going to address what happened in November with the last night meeting. I cannot express to you how frustrating that was to be a parent and a community member and, and being locked out of a public school board meeting. Now, many of you, I don't know, many of you probably have children and grandchildren. Have you ever been locked out? of a public school board meeting when your kids are attending the school. Anybody? Can anybody ra raise your hand if you have? We have. We were locked out. It's completely unacceptable. There, there's no excuse. And I know Andy said something after me, and of course I didn't hear it because I was locked out. I thought you were disappointed that we didn't come in and talk to you. I, I want to set the record. I, I approached Mr. Butler two or three times, now in his defense, it was a little bit, you know, I don't want to say chaotic, but there's there a lot going on out there. I didn't get a chance to go in. Either he didn't hear me, or he ignored me, I don't know. I tried to come in and talk to you, and I, and I didn't get a chance to. And what's doubly frustrating is, I stood behind this microphone at the meeting before that, and requested that you, you have the meetings at night like this. And I don't know if you just didn't hear me, because I had to speak through this and I was speaking quickly, or you just didn't want to hear me. But for some reason, we went through the whole rigmarole, and all, all that was unnecessary. It, it, it caused a strife in the community between the sheriff's department and the community members. It caused a strife between us and you that we didn't need. There's people out here that want to come and speak at public meetings. They care about the school. You have teachers willing to pull up here and risk, hopefully nothing, but risk and tell you how they're feeling and what's going on, and you're locking us out. Of course, I talked about that for two minutes and I didn't want to. That's great. So, what was my issue? <laughs> kids at grade level. All right, the younger kids, in my opinion, are not at grade level. I know I got two, I have twin boys who are in kindergarten that are not at grade level. They're not at kindergarten level. I see the work coming home. It's not at grade level. And it's because they were in virtual learning for almost a year. Now, older kids might have done better. The younger kids have not. And I know you may not be considering virtual, but it's, it's at the hub level. 30 right? seconds. I'm imploring you not to do virtual learning because it does not work for a large demographic of kids. If we're going to, we're already doing half days. 
And if we're going to get the kids back on track, how are we going to do that? We're not going to be able to do it for virtual learning. The kids deserve to be in school, and the reason they deserve to be in school is because there's great teachers in the school, and that in-person instruction is what they need. You can't get it done virtually. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Our next speaker is Kristen Hazel, and the issue is uh, safety.
This, to me, is a great example on why our government is just way too big. It's, it's, the board needs to be closer to the people, as far as I'm concerned, because the government is run best when it's closest to you and I. I feel like as if school choice should be a great option, parent choice should come overall. Now, when you go to, let's say, Salisbury Christian, they have their own school board. Um, well, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I feel like we need to break this up. We need to get closer to the people. That way the people have more of a choice and a say on what happens on their school. Governor Hogan and the elected school board for the state should have no say what happens with my kids that I don't even have yet. And I'm scared to even have kids because of the society that we live in. Now, I shouldn't have this problem. And this is very, this is, this is scary to me. And I didn't bring no fancy speech up here because, you know what, I'm just speaking from right, right here. In 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Anyway, those are my concerns. And, you know, school choice. If you can push for that, push for that. I know some people don't want to hear that. I'm sorry. But at the end of the day, that's where we need to be, closer to the people. If you want the best, because government screws everything up. There's never been a thing the government's done that hasn't screwed it up. So, school choice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Craig Mitchell, and the issue is virtual learning. and Superintendent Dr. Hanley. I'm Craig Mitchell, and I'm an instructional assistant at Bennett Middle. My comments this evening is not limited to virtual learning, but I'll be brief in the designated time. I would like to share with you this evening what my day looks like as an IA. Since we have returned to in-person instruction, my job has definitely been very stressful, amongst others. Students have had difficulty adjusting to being back in the school buildings. Some student behavior has been very challenging. The continuing threat of COVID has made work exhausting because of following COVID protocols, such as wearing a mask, trying to physically distance, and the fear of getting sick. Many of us are struggling as an IA to even make ends meet, whether it's instruction, in-person instruction, or virtual. Either way, it's tough. And we feel that the Board of Ed has not kept up with increasing wages, and is now, as a result of this matter, paying the price with many vacancies staying unfilled. And we're asking tonight that the BOE consider to increase our wages as instructional assistants across the board considerably to keep up and reward those who are willing to contribute to our public county public schools, whether in person or virtual. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Carlos Ayala. Issue transparency posting Q&A online. If I mispronounce your last name, sir, I'm sorry. No, that was actually perfect. I was, yeah, I have this whole thing written out about how I was going to correct you. Pronunciation. <laughs> I'm so used to that. that. <laughs> this is pretty cool. I mean, it really is. The parents, teachers, that we have an opportunity to speak to you guys. You guys are listening to us. I'd like to thank you for that. I also really appreciate that you guys put this online and to the people who make that happen. Um, you guys aren't quite Netflix, but uh, <laughs> I actually enjoy watching the videos. Um, one thing that I think would be helpful, um, there, there's been a lot of really good, thoughtful questions that people have asked, and they don't get an answer in this form, and I understand, 
there's, there's not time for that. But you guys respond to them. But you respond to them privately. And my guess is there's an awful lot of people that would like to know the answers to those questions, but they don't, they don't get an answer. Um, I respectfully ask that you guys post online the questions and the answers that parents decide, my parents, teachers, whoever. And, uh, and if you guys can't do that, I'd like one of those private answers as to why not. Thank you. <laughs> Fair enough, thank you. Next speaker is Sandy Spedden, and the issue was left blank. <laughs> that concern me. I think a lot of them have already been addressed today, so I'm not going to try to go over all of those. But my concern is that I agree that the way we should look at this is through the local boards, not through the state, not certainly not through the federal government. Because we found out in the past year, the federal government is not interested in us it's not interested in the taxpayers. It's not interested in the parents who are being called terrorists. They only want to do whatever they can to get more money out of us. And I'm hoping that this board will stand up to them and stand up for the people here in Wicomico County. We need to have trust in you people here on the board. And some of you, a couple of you know, I would like to get to know the others sometime. But anyway, um, we need to teach our school children the correct facts about America, about history, about civics, and the true founding of our country. There's a lot of revisionist history being taught. I don't even know if civics is being taught today, because I'm not, I don't have children or school or grandchildren close by. So uh, this critical race theory, I know a lot of people talk about that. But it is brainwashing, it is indoctrinating our children to hate this country, to hate each other. It's bringing more divisiveness. And I hope the school board will keep that out of our schools here in Wicomico County. Um, we need to expose the truth to Americans about what our nation's children are really being taught, which are being paid for by our hard-earned tax dollars, too. So, I'm just hoping that you will listen to the people and be accessible if they want to call you. We should be able to call any of our school board members, I feel. And we need to. And I hope that will be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Our final speaker, I, I hope I'm pronouncing the first name correctly, Michelle Hales, and the issue is keep schools open. pronouncing my name. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> um, thank you for um, allowing me this chance to speak tonight. And I'm coming as a parent and just urging you to keep schools open. I know um, some of what's going on in Delaware right now and I realize that it's a real um, threat and issue that may be coming to our area as well. And so um, in light of just thinking about that, I wanted to read some statistics which are pre-COVID. Okay, so I will put that um, out there, but roughly 35% of children in the United States enter school without the skills necessary for learning to read. One out of five children is reading impaired by the time he reaches fourth grade. 38% of our nation's fourth grade children are reading below a basic level of proficiency. This has long-term effects. 
The U.S. Office of Technology has estimated that 25% of the adult workforce does not read well enough to meet routine requirements of today's workplace. 5% of children learn how to read on their own. 30% of children learn to read fairly easily when they are taught to read. 60% of children find reading hard to learn when they are taught. There is nearly 90% probability that a child will remain a poor reader at the end of the fourth grade if the child is a poor reader at the end of first grade. 90 to 95% of poor readers can reach average reading skills with early intervention. If that intervention is delayed until nine years of age, then 75% of these children will continue to have difficulty learning to read throughout high school. And also I wanted to point out, because I would like to touch on some of the um, issues related to this, so also socioeconomic status plays a huge role in some of these numbers. And there are studies that have shown that families in a higher economic status, when their children are out for the summer, they actually progress academically. When they come back to school in the fall, they're further ahead of their peers. Children in lower socioeconomic groups actually come back behind. They've lost learning from the previous school year. So we know that the pandemic is affecting families and lower socioeconomic classes the most. Almost any difficulty that will come to a community will affect those groups the most. And so I'm urging you to keep schools open if at all possible, to stay away from virtual learning because it is really adversely affecting our children. I wanted to read a quote from Mayor Lori Lightfoot from Chicago. This was with respect to everything that went on last seconds. week. Nobody signs up for being a homeschooler at the last minute. We can't forget about how disruptive that remote process is to individual parents who have to work, who can't afford the luxury of staying home. And also, just a reminder that President Biden on January 5th urged schools to stay open. He said that, um, well, I'll just leave it with that. He urged schools to stay open, and so I second that and would like you to consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That concludes our public comment portion of the uh, agenda. I do want to comment. I very much appreciate all the people who made public comments, not only for your comments and your thoughts, but how much um, you respected the time and how much you respected everyone in the room with your comments. It was one of the best public comment forums I've ever sat through in the last six and a half years on the board. So thank you very much. We, as we always will, we all took notes. We'll get answers for you. We'll definitely look into, I know I'm not supposed to answer to a public comment, but I'm going to. We are definitely going to look into the Q&A online because I think that's a great idea and I heard a lot of applause for that. And to be fair, Mr. Palmer had talked to me about that earlier in the week. So um, it's, it's something we'll look into. So I've broken the rule there by answering the public comment. But <laughs> so, um, so again, thank you very much. I thought it was just a great opportunity for us all to interact. And it's, it's, wonderful. So let's, thank you. we'll move on to 3.7, the superintendent's report. Dr. Hansel. I have um, several things, uh, Mr. Malone, board members and, and community members to um, report on tonight, and I will make the first one about uh, what's happening with COVID in our schools, um, because I know there are a lot of questions out there. I want to tell you what our current thinking is and what our current planning is. Um, as I've been saying all year, we are going to stay the course. We are going to do everything possible or committed to keeping our schools open. Um, however, there's always a however, um, I just want to make sure that you're aware of some of the struggles that we are having and how we are working with our health department and so forth. Um, every day, I get a report on COVID cases in our schools, and we're watching it very carefully. What we are not seeing now is spread in our schools. If we, are, if we were to be and to have spread in our schools, that would probably be a different kind of conversation that we're having with our health department about the need to close any classrooms or perhaps a school. But we're not, I'm, I'm only 
cautioning you if that were to become the case. So we are watching that every day. Um, so so we, as I said, we are committed to keeping our schools open because we do know that that is the best possible way to instruct our students for the vast majority of our students. Um, our, in addition to instruction, we do continue to make safety a top priority. And not only do we are we concerned about any kind of spread among students or staff specific to our schools, but we also are concerned about staff illness and staff vacancies. And right now we are not in a place where we are concerned enough that we may have to close a school for those reasons, but we're also watching that very carefully. Dr. Briggs and I both get a report every day that shows us the percentage of staff who are out in any given building, because that is a safety concern. We cannot operate a building if there are a certain number of uh, staff and support staff, not just teachers, but support staff, including cafeteria employees. Del Mar Elementary had to close, excuse me, Del Mar High School closed earlier this week for a half a day because they didn't have, they had so many cafeteria employees who were out, they couldn't serve lunch. So those are the kinds of things that we are keeping an eye on, bus drivers. We are having to watch all um, areas of our organization and turn employee groups um, to ensure that we continue to run our schools safely. Our hope is to be able to do that and to not close a classroom or to close a school. We will not close the school system unless we are mandated to do so. So that's where we stand with that and we will continue to um, communicate with, with our uh, community about that. We do, in, in the event that we have to go to virtual learning for a temporary period for a class or a school, and I emphasize temporary period, it is important that we be able to move to that mode quickly in the event that that happens. So we are, I'm communicating and tonight, and then we will be communicating through schools the need for teachers and families to begin to uh, take laptops home, to take resources home, in the event that that has to happen. Again, we're hoping it doesn't happen, but we need to be prepared for that to, to happen if, it, if we have to do a temporary shift to virtual learning. And parents should communicate needs, and you'll hear this from your schools, should communicate needs that you have in terms of laptops or hotspots or any kind of issues that you have um, connecting. I can tell you if that happened in a classroom, it would not be six, seven, eight hours a day online synchronously with a teacher. It would be a lot of asynchronous learning with some ability to but that will come further down the road if we have to do that. Um, our, as I said, started out, our commitment is to keep our schools open, every classroom open, if at all possible. Um, I want to touch base briefly or just uh, touch on the new emergency regulation on face coverings. Um, it did pass through the um, AELR, the Legislative Review Committee, um, which basically extended the mask mandate in schools, but with what they're calling off-ramps. I think I made a, a brief presentation about this at a previous board meeting, but it did pass. And so I think uh, one of the public commenters did mention about what those off-ramps are, um, that it, we're talking about 80% of the community or 80% of a school that has been vaccinated, or if you can't reach those thresholds, then um, we are, you're looking at whether there is um, a transmission rate in the community that is, according to the CDC, and you can find this on our website, that we're either in the low to moderate range in terms of community transmission. Unfortunately, right now, we are in the highest category in Montgomery County, and that is high. Before the holiday, we've gotten down into substantial, so we thought we were moving in the right direction, and hopefully when we get past this surge, we'll be back on the, on the right track. Um, so that is the, um, the map.
mask mandate from the state. Um, I, I'm going to ask Mrs. Moss to talk just for a minute about the new CDC guidance in terms of um, isolation and uh, quarantine just to um, let the community and the board know where we stand okay. with that guidance. Thank you, Dr. Hamlin and Mr. Miller and Mr. Murray, board members. Um, I start with a disclaimer to say that I am very fortunate to uh, be working with our health services supervisor and coordinator who work with our nurses in our schools every single day and know this guidance and these protocols without hesitation. So uh, with that, I will summarize. And please keep in mind, all of this information is available on the CDC website as well as mailing coronavirus. There's an entire section uh, devoted to schools and communication systems. So if, uh, quick summary, if a person is positive, confirmed or suspected, there is isolation for five days um, from the symptom onset or the date of the positive test if there, there were not symptoms. And it's important to keep in mind that day one, sorry, there's an echo on the side, I apologize, Day one uh, is counted as the first full day after the onset of symptoms or the first full day after the test, if it's positive. After five days, here's where the change comes in. If there are no symptoms or improved symptoms, and 24 hours of fever-free without medication have passed, then the person, student, adult, can return to school, child care, work, and they must continue to wear well-fitting masks for the uh, additional five days. This applies to a person with a positive, vaccinated, or unvaccinated. So let's transition to a person who is a close contact. I know there have been a lot of questions around that. If the person is exposed to a positive case or is a close contact, they, if they are vaccinated, including booster, if they're booster eligible, so that means they've uh, now gone to five months since Moderna or Pfizer or two months since the Johnson & Johnson, and they've had their booster, and they have no symptoms, there is no quarantine. Um, it is recommended that after five days that they are tested, uh, just to confirm. If they're positive, we would go to this protocol that I just uh, described. And if they're negative, they would continue to um, wear their mask. And again, that's a big change. There is no quarantine required in, when those parameters are met. Same point in time if the person is exposed as a close contact to a positive case. If they are vaccinated and booster eligible but have not had the booster, or if they are not vaccinated, they would quarantine for the five days, get tested at day five. And if it's positive, you go to the standard protocol. And if it's negative, then they would be able to come out of quarantine. The big change there is the five days. Previously, that would have been referenced as 10 days with specific parameters. So again, CDC um, website, also Maryland Coronavirus website has the information for schools. And also I encourage you to keep an eye, as I'm sure you already do, on our WCBOE.org website where we post the information um, which is taken from the CDC website. And it also has that uh, graphic that shows and then has the definition for what goes into that transmission rate that Dr. Hamlin referenced is high. You can see it is case rates for 100,000 and positives over a seven day period. They look at two different areas. So um, anytime anyone has a question about their well being, a symptom, or a protocol, everyone is encouraged if you have a child in school, call your school nurse. You're also always welcome to call our health services supervisor, Kathy Frisch, and our health services coordinator, Jen Davis, at the Board of Ed, at the central office at Northgate, and we will be as responsive as time allows us to be, which is usually immediate, uh, so that we can get you the information. I also remind everyone to keep an eye on the health department website, as they offer free testing, and they post on a regular basis the timing do encourage you, if you wish to take in that, to call and set an appointment. They do take walk-ins, but they, would, they prefer appointments just to have timeliness in your benefit. Dr. Um, okay, Trans 
transitioning away from COVID, um, I would like to introduce uh, Mrs. Grace Murdoch, and I believe with her is uh, Martin Hutchinson, Reverend Martin Hutchinson, to come to the table. Um, and they have a presentation related to um, SDY kindness. Before we begin, I just want to take a moment and say thank you to all of you at the table. You are in a tough position. In many ways, it's a no-win position. And I know that you are doing the best you can to provide excellent leadership for our county and our schools. It's been a tough time. Thank you for my Now, I'm here as a kindness commissioner in the city of Salisbury. And prior to COVID, we had seven kindness clubs in our school. And we wanted to do something to encourage their efforts. Uh, and so we had a contest and randomly selected three of those seven clubs to receive $200 each. Hopefully when things open back up and we can do kindness clubs again, we will be able, they will be able to use those funds to jumpstart their efforts to increase the kindness in our community because it's sorely needed. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So this was done very officially with an internet little wheel that uh, was witnessed by more than one kindness commissioner. Um, and I'm so happy to finally be uh, distributing this money, Kind SBY, operates purely on sponsorships at kindsby.org and on donations. And we are so thrilled to get this into our schools and into the community through teaching our students and staff about kindness. So if representatives from Pinehurst Elementary, Waikamako Middle, and Parkside High can come forward, I have a check for each of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamlin. Uh, so this uh, month we have, or last month of December, we had some great extra ball award winners. And I'm so happy to talk about them and bring them up and recognize them tonight. Our first is Miss Patty Brown. Uh, if she could come up, that would be great. Miss Brown in here, okay? And also Miss Nicholson, her principal. She's a music teacher at Willard's Elementary School. And she not only provides exceptional instruction to the students, but lots of extra fun. So listen to this. She went above and beyond teaching students, come on up, winter and holiday songs that they performed and sang along to during a virtual pre-recorded assembly. She provided each student a jingle bell necklace to use as an instrument. Additionally, she worked with a kindergarten class to teach them the song and dance pajama party to perform live announcements on the all-day students wore pajamas to school. So Ms. Brown keeps the arts program alive and vibrant. Not only does she go out of her way to make learning music fun for the students, she also offers her assistance with students as a mentor as well. So we want to congratulate 
Ms. Patty Brown as an Extra Mile Award winner. If you guys will come on in. Tracy will take your picture. Now, you're also, Ms. Brown, going to get a plaque. Um, they weren't ready today because the person that does our uh, plaques has COVID, so they weren't able to do it. So, but Tracy wants to take your picture. So let's give a big hand to Ms. Patty Brown. Willard Elementary School. Our next is Brian Croswell, a custodian at Pinehurst Elementary. Did he show up? Brian, come on up, sir. And also Ms. Chelsea Seabreeze, principal at Pinehurst. Now, I hear that Brian comes to school every day with a smile. Is that correct? <laughs> he is dedicated to the building. No task is too small for him. He happily cleans up messes from the pre-K scholars. He willingly assists during dismissal and has even jump-started the car in need of assistance every once in a while. Spreads joy in the cafeteria and assists his co-workers with scholars as they eat their lunch. He greets every uh, scholar and staff member with a smile. His passion is contagious and he has evident dedication that is his evident. And uh, what Piners is truly blessed to have Mr. Cosmo as their a custodian and also an extra mile award winner. So congratulations, sir. <laughs> and you also will get a plaque as well. And Tracy wants to get your picture. Thank you. We appreciate all the work you do for Pinehurst Elementary School. All right. Let's give him a big hand. Sharon Gross Howard from Margella Middle and High School. She's an instru instructional assistant, and her principal is Liza Hastings. Come on up. And I'll talk about them as they make their way up. Ms. Howard is pivotal in student uh, success because she helps students stay organized, focused, and positive. She encourages students with positive feedback and makes it a point to help them in any way that she can. She serves as a one-on-one -on -one for a student with autism, but is a positive light to all students. She's also an active member of the Kindness Club at Mardella Middle High School, and she is certainly a role model of kindness. So we want to congratulate Ms. Sharon Gross Howard as an Extra Mile Award winner. So congratulations. <laughs> the strengths of the county and school system, 
the characteristics the public believes a superintendent should possess, and what challenges a new superintendent may face. There will be a press release very shortly that will define when that survey will open and how long it will be open so people can go on and take the survey, which we encourage everyone in the public to do that. Once the survey is reviewed, the board will work with May to develop advertising, candidate characteristics and interview questions and set a timeline for application and subsequent interviews. The board intends to make a final decision that is announced by the end of May or early June. So you'll be hearing a lot more about the search process and we're going to keep the community and everyone, you know, staff, public at large, uh, involved in every step of the way and keep you updated on what's going on. So I wanted to let you know where we are at this point in the process. Okay. 4.1, approval of open session minutes. We had those in advance. I assume you had time to read them. I'll entertain a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Okay. 5.1 to 5.6 are our consent items. So 5.7, upon the recommendation of the superintendent, is our motion to approve the consent items. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of approving the consent items, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? They carried. Okay, 6.1. At the December 16th meeting of Curriculum Council, Dr. Hall presented the novel fourth grade rats for consideration for use in grade three ELA classes. The novel received unanimous support from the council with a recommendation that it move forward to the board for consideration and approval. Upon the recommendation of the superintendent is our motion to approve the novel fourth grade rats for first reading. So moved. Second. Okay. I see it's not Dr. Hall. <laughs> 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 Good evening, Dr. Rager. Thank you very much, Chair Murray, Dr. Hanlon, and board members. Uh, Dr. Hall really wanted to be here this evening. Unfortunately, she uh, was not able to make it, so I will do my best to uh, act in her stead for the three books that she was very happy to bring to the uh, curriculum council last month and to the board uh, tonight. Um, the first one on the list, fourth grade rats, may sound familiar to board members. Uh, just a few months ago, you approved a novel by the same author called Third Grade Angels. This is the sequel to that. It follows the same cast of characters. It too is recommended for third grade. Students will read that first book, Third Grade Angels, earlier in the school year, and then towards the end as they're getting ready to transition to fourth grade, we'll read Fourth Grade Rats. That's a great story. The students really love the uh, books by Jerry Spinelli. They're humorous, but they also carry a good message. And the main message of this book is for students to, to learn to really act uh, on their own, do what they know is right, not act to impress others. And that's a, one of the major themes of that, as well as how to respond to bullying. I'll stand for any questions. So any questions for Dr. Ray? I don't have any questions, but I have actually read all three of these books. They are fantastic. I like to read all the books that are suggested and talked about and that the speakers bring. Um, so these three books are definitely the ones. Very good. Um, as a member of the um, committee, I did read those books, and they do have a message, and they're very pleasant, and I'm sure the children will enjoy them. I've enjoyed reading them. Also, I'd like to add that uh, I enjoy reading the evaluation from the students, both parents and teachers, but the students are really the ones I thoroughly enjoy. Once we could read, but they would some of them when they would do them, they would draw little pictures and they would like write and then they would draw arrows so that we, you know, they were using exclamation points to explain all the things that were happening in the books that they found excitement with. So I really think the students are going to enjoy them. Okay, I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor. Okay, 6.2. The, 
December 16th meeting of the Curriculum Council, Dr. Hall presented the novel Out of My Mind for consideration for use in grade four ELA classes. The novel received unanimous support from the council with a recommendation that it move forward to the board for consideration and approval. Upon the recommendation of the superintendent, is there a motion to approve the novel Out of My Mind for first reading? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Rager. Yes, another of the story, uh, not humorous, but a very touching story about an amazing little girl. It's a novel, it's, uh, it's fiction, but amazing little girl who has cerebral palsy and due to that doesn't have the ability to communicate or even hardly move her body, so she feels kind of trapped. And partly through the story she learns about is finally able to receive a communication device, which really helps her begin kind of fitting in. It's a story of her trying to fit in and navigate, not just being in, in school and, and coming into adolescence, but navigating through the difficulties so, uh, of her disability. So, very touching story. Uh, helps kids uh, learn about and respond to peer pressure in dealing with students who are different than, from themselves. Comments or questions? In this story, Elvira is the tool that um, the main character uses to communicate with her friends and um, her one on one and with her teacher and with Miss B, who is her tutor after school. Um, so I almost finished reading the book and she has um, made the math team. She's the only one in the history of the teacher who's been doing this math um, team. She has scored correctly every single question that he has asked for the three weeks that they're prepping up to this competition. So I went on Amazon, I had asked Mrs. Hall for the sequel, which we haven't got that far yet on the curriculum. Uh, committee, so um, it arrived. My husband got me the book for Christmas, so the sequel to it. So I'm super excited to start reading that one as well. So I'll make sure I pass it on to Mr. Brown and Ms. Kowalski. Any other comments or questions? I just thought it was very interesting to uh, have the students understand and uh, read about students with disabilities. It gives them a better understanding of how to we have a lot of students in our schools with disabilities, and I think we need books like this. I enjoy reading it. I read all the novels that come before the curriculum committee. Okay, I assume you're ready to vote on the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It carries. 6.3. At the December 16th meeting of Curriculum Council, Dr. Hall presented the novel Home of the Brave for consideration for use in grade five ELA classes. The novel received unanimous support from the council with a recommendation that it move forward to the board for consideration and approval. On the recommendation of the superintendent, is there a motion to approve the novel Home of the Brave for first reading? Is there a second? Dr. Rick. Thank you. Uh, we had books for third and fourth grade. This book, Home of the Brave for fifth grade, deals with a, a, a child, a young man, young uh, boy who is in Africa. Most of his family is killed, and he actually is able to come to the United States and gets to experience a lot of, of the, uh, the things that we take for granted. So it gives the children, our students, a chance to, to see what, what we have, what they may take for granted through the eyes of someone who hasn't had those types of, of privileges. Uh, teaches students about empathy through hardships uh, that others may have experienced, highlights different cultures, and several of the reviewers uh, know they're also that it'll tie very well with social studies, so it gives us some cross curricular connections. We're having a lot of students coming into our school system that are very similar to the young man in this story, and uh, I think it's very relevant have something like this with children. Okay, I assume you're ready to vote on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, carried. Thank you, Dr. Rager. Thank you. 6.4, Shipman Elementary HVAC update. On recommendation of the superintendent, is there a motion to authorize the following contract amendment 
to the contracting firm Keller Construction Management, a division of Keller Brothers, Inc., to incorporate the guaranteed maximum price for the Chipman Elementary HVAC upgrade project. Amendment number one in the amount of three million two fifty five three hundred twelve thousand includes the base GMP and selected alternates one to three, value of recommended alternates one hundred twenty thousand eight oh five. Is there a motion? Is there a motion? Second. second. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Got a second. This is Ashby. Good evening. Today we are seeking board approval of the guaranteed maximum price for Chipman Elementary HVAC upgrade project. It includes the acceptance of base bid and all alternates. Chipman Elementary's last major renovation was in 1986. This project is a holistic replacement of the HVAC system, more specifically the removal of the existing above ceiling heat pump units and various air handlers, and replacing them with variable refrigerant flow equipment and dedicated outdoor air rooftop equipment. This project will start this summer and will be executed in multiple phases with an anticipated substantial completion of April 2023. There is a modular on site to assist with classroom swing space and we will continue to coordinate with site-based administration. The majority of the scope of work will be executed by contractors from either Wacomico County or the Eastern Shore. I'd like to acknowledge Keller's efforts to provide multiple subcontractor opportunities for what is primarily a mechanical systemic project. They received up to 19 bids, and the largest division, Mechanical, had three bids, which is good given the volatility in the construction market. This is an elementary and secondary school emergency relief, also known as ESSER funded project, and was engineered based upon the guidance of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, also known as ASHRAE, regarding COVID-19. Are there any questions regarding this recommendation? Questions for Mrs. Uh, I have a question, but it's not about this. I, I, Lisa, you answered this before, but I have to back. What's the, the uh, timeline for replacing the windows and chipping? Uh, that was a separate contract. That's occurring this summer as well. Okay, I assume you're ready to vote on the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Okay, 6.5. Fund recommendation of superintendent, is there a motion to authorize the following contract amendment to the contracting firm, to authorize the following contract amendment to the contracting firm Keller Construction Management, the division of Keller Brothers, Inc. To incorporate the guaranteed maximum price for the Glen Avenue Elementary miscellaneous HVAC window and door upgrade project. Is there a motion? Hold. How about a second? Thank you. All right, Mrs. Ashby. Good evening. Today we are seeking approval of the guaranteed maximum price for Glen Avenue Elementary HVAC window and door upgrade project. This project is an extension of phased HVAC work completed recently. Phase one during summer of 2020 included upgrades to the gymnasium, cafeteria, and some surrounding corridors. Phase two during summer of 2021 included upgrades to classrooms, nurses suite, and various support spaces. The remaining HVAC work for phase three includes remaining classrooms and media center. This project will be completed over two summers in 2022 and 2023 with the HVAC portion this summer and the window and door replacement during both summers. The majority of the scope of work will be executed by contractors from either Wacomico County or the Eastern Shore. I'd like to acknowledge Keller's efforts to provide multiple subcontractor opportunities with 13 bid packages and up to 30 bids. The two largest divisions, mechanical and glazing, received two to four bids, which is good given the volatility in the construction market, and recommended subcontractors are both from Wacomico County. This is an elementary and secondary school emergency relief, also known as ESSER funded project, and was engineered based upon the guidance of the CDC and ASHRAE regarding COVID-19. Are there any questions regarding this recommendation? Hearing none, I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, carry. 6.6. On the recommendation of the School Building Commission and the Superintendent, is there a motion to authorize the development of an early bid package to address current construction related supply chain delays and projected inflation risk for mechanical and electrical equipment? 
steel and roof insulation for phase one of the Mardella Middle and High Renovation Project. Is there a motion? No move. Second. Okay. okay. Got a second. This is Ashton. Okay. This one's going to be a little bit longer. All right. Good evening, Dr. Hanlon, Chairman Lund, Vice Chair Murray, and board members. We're here tonight to give you an update on the Mardella Addition and Renovation Project. Next page. Given the potential use of Built to Learn funds, also known as uh, BTL, addressing construction related supply chain delays, state and local funding limitations, and projected inflation risks, this project is proceeding out of sequence from a traditional capital funded project. Upon recommendation of the architecture, engineering, and construction management team and the school building commission, the project will require an early bid package. Starting earlier will also allow Wacomico an opportunity to retain project management control while the Maryland Stadium Authority attempts to increase staffing to address the influx of BTL eligible school construction projects. We're going to quickly highlight the progress since your approval of design development in October 2021 following this agenda. Next page. First up is an update on capital funding sources. Next. We've been discussing the potential use of BTL funds dating back to the FY 2022 Capital Improvement Program and budget. Highlighted in yellow is from the current FY 2023 Capital Improvement Program and budget, which was approved by the board back in September of 2021. Highlighted in green is likely to change based upon the future funding allocations by the Interagency Commission on Public School Construction, and we'll discuss that in more detail towards the end. Next. The county's FY 2022 bond sale was completed in December of 21, and the $10 million for Mardella is now available for use. The county executive continues to support the board's funding require, requests for Mardella, and here's an excerpt at the top from his FY 2023 CIP submitted to the council. Below that is the IAC's projected funding allocations for Mardella. The percentages shown are related to the overall IAC's capital budget, established by the governor at $208 million. This is different from the IAC's assumed $280 million allocation. The IAC has been trying to shift to flat funding, which they are now referring to as a target allocation. In addition, they could freeze the allocation for the current FY 2023 recommendations as well as the next two fiscal years. The APPN, shown in the pink, stands for Available Prior Year Appropriations. This is something new and separate and won't be finalized until May of 2022. These are funds that either went unspent or closed out under budget from other LEAs that have reverted to the IEC. For reference, in the upper right-hand corner from the previous slide, we requested $12 million from the IEC, and they are attempting to get to $10 million with the proposed APPN included. However, Built to Learn funds are available now and can be accessed once we have an executed MOU. Next. Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. As discussed back in September regarding the FY 2023 CIP, the Stadium Authority has control over who can manage a school construction project that receives BTL funds. In addition, the use of ETL funds requires an MOU between the Stadium Authority, the Board of Education, and the County Government. Um, so basically, starting back in September, let me see this. We initiated discussions with the executive and finance staff associated with the board's FY23 CIP. It was determined that Mardell would likely need BTL unless the county could forward a significant um, portion of the project. From October to November, various meetings with the executive and finance staff, senior leadership team with the Board of Ed, or with the Comico County Public Schools, School Building Commission, Interagency Commission on Public School Construction, Department of General Services, and the Stadium Authority. During that time frame, the IAC approved Mardella for BTL. The executive staff, school building commission, board, and senior leadership team requested that Wacomico County Public Schools retain project management control. In December, the Stadium Authority authorized WCPS to retain project management control. 
the architect, engineer, and construction management team then developed a revised project step strategy, which would require an early bid package and potentially an earlier construction start, and the School Building Commission approved. We've since received the draft MOU and have, and have done an initial review. The Stadium Authority anticipates a first quarter FY 2022 bond sale, which would be around April 2022, and would be available to us with an executed MOU. Throughout all of these discussions, all stakeholders agreed the use of BTL funds was a positive for the Mardella project to ensure that it could be executed not only because of funding, but by also retaining local control of the project's last phase of design and construction. Next. Now we look at where the team is regarding design and pre-construction. Next. This was the design schedule from the design development approval. The architecture, engineering, and construction management team immediately initiated construction documents after board approval of the design development. As you can see, there's no change to the design schedule. However, with the approval of an early bid package, the guaranteed maximum price will be split into two parts. This also provides an opportunity to start construction earlier and potentially hedge some inflation, and we'll get into that in more detail soon. Next. Construction documents are over halfway complete. We've had several discussions with the Department of General Services, DGS, and the Interagency Commission staff after the IAC approved Mardella as eligible for BTL funds. With the project now requiring an early bid package that would essentially occur before our construction document submission, it required authorization by DGS to do so. In addition, where the guaranteed maximum price will now be in two parts, and part one, the early bid package, will occur before the IAC's approval of the FY23 traditional CIP allocation, as well as the board's approval of the combined final GMP, it required acknowledgement by the IAC that a single contract submission will be allowed instead of two separate submissions, so that we could meet the timing of the FY2022 BTL bond sale. Please keep in mind that the use of BTL funds offsets a portion of the project's traditional IAC funding. So both the Stadium Authority and the IEC are eager to get projects underway as quickly as possible. Next. Let's look at what's included in the proposed early bid package. Next. At the December School Building Commission meeting, it was reviewed in detail why an early bid package was necessary due to the anticipated BTL funding. Keeping in mind trying to retain project management control, as well as address construction-related supply chain issues and a reduction in traditional IEC CIP funding. A quick reminder that we are utilizing construction management at risk with design assist for this project, which helps with ensuring the early bid package is properly coordinated within the overall project. For example, the generator had to be sized by the engineer simultaneously with manufacturer availability and installing sequence verified by the subcontractor. The board approved the generator purchase in December because it had the longest lead time and is necessary to support the life safety systems. The bulk of the phase one equipment is mechanical and electrical, steel and roof insulation to serve phase one of the construction project. GMP part one could be upwards of 4.6 million and part two will be the remaining trade contracts. There is no change to fees or general conditions because they are locked in at the time of the construction management selection process and any applicable cost savings return to the owner per contract. Next. As mentioned earlier, we would need to start construction earlier for various reasons. Next. This is what was approved with the design development. And we want to be clear, you aren't formally approving this revised construction schedule. That will happen with the construction documents. However, this is what the revised schedule would likely be if we're able to secure BTL funds through an executed MOU. Next. The phasing of the project would also change. Even with an early start, phase one is slightly extended from what was presented at design development. However, we could potentially finish earlier. If at any time we face a significant cash flow challenge, we would assess work complete versus schedule and pause the project in between phases. This is only possible because phase one in yellow contains the new mechanical electrical room, which all other new or renovated areas will connect to. Next. We'll now review the overall project budget. Next. 
The major concern of all stakeholders is if the overall project budget of $72.1 million can be maintained. And we won't know that until the final GMP is established. There's approximately 11% of budget protection within the overall project budget consisting of projected escalation and various contingencies. And this is not new. These are utilized strategies on all projects due to the amount of time it takes to secure initial funding in relation to project implementation. However, at this time, it doesn't include alternates, which are essentially adds to a project. The team is evaluating life cycle material selections as well as items that could potentially be purchased later should we run into further budget issues. As of now, we still have an ff &E component in the budget as well, which could be utilized as a last resort. Next. So back to the green highlights. The project eligibility uh, calculations for capital improvement projects have greatly fluctuated the past few years. There are several variables, and each one can change depending upon the CIP instructions issued by the IEC. <coughs> the basic components of the calculation are eligible building square footage, cost per square foot, enrollments, and defined eligible costs. Enrollments at Mardella actually went up during 2020. We already pointed out a slight increase in overall project budget, however, it's not at a local cost. Based upon the projected 90% IEC recommendation, it appears that the project could be eligible for up to 48 million, of which 13.8 would be from BTF. However, due to the IEC's reduction in target allocations, those funds would be stretched out over several fiscal years. If we're able to secure BTL funds, which if I haven't mentioned already, requires an MOU, and lock into the projected IAC calculated eligible costs, which we anticipate in May of 2022, the overall cost split may change moving forward. For now, we are relying on starting the project with local funds until BTL and the FY 2023 IAC funds are available later this year. Next. So what is the board proving? Essentially, we need to get an earlier start in order to accept BTL funds, retain project management control, while trying to get ahead of supply chain issues and inflation risks. At this point in time, this is the board's best chance to execute the additions and renovations to Mardella due to projected reductions in traditional IAC funding. Next. So essentially, you're authorizing us to proceed with an early bid package for phase one items noted in the agenda item and we anticipate approval of these, those bids in March of 2022. It's important to highlight the risk associated with doing this, not only in advance of construction document approval by DGS, but before receiving funding via BTL and locking into the FY 2023 traditional IAC funding allocation. The good news is we've retained local control of the project. What happens if we don't take BTL and start construction first and, and start construction as currently scheduled in the first quarter of 2023? The project is unlikely to survive the continued increased costs in both labor and materials combined with higher inflation. In addition, the county would have to forward fund even more of the project, which would negatively impact the board's other priority CIP projects in future years. Could you click it just one more time? So to reiterate, Access to BTL funds requires an MOU, and that would be the next step should you approve us proceeding with an early bid package. And I stand for any questions you may have. Don't have any questions, but I do have a comment. Uh, I don't know if everybody caught the words that uh, Ms. Askey said earlier about funds available from projects, prior projects that were done more time and under cost words being on time and under cost, that's just about unheard of in modern construction today. So our team at the physical plant led by this uh, is doing an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. So where did the BTL funds come from? Uh, it was referred to as uh, House Bill 1, Built to Learn Act. Um, it went into effect July 1st of 2021. So that we would use those, as, but that would, not in addition to what we're already getting from the IAC. Is what no, so about. what's happening is the IAC is reducing their allocations, which stretches 
their um, situation out longer. So, so BTL BDL funds becomes start. a bridge for Mardella. That, that makes sense. to be able to start this thing earlier or at least on time. So a lot of discussions surrounded, um, especially with the School Building Commission, they didn't want the stating authority to run the project. They wanted to retain local control. So we basically, Good. there was a window of opportunity because the stating authority is just started as July. They haven't been able to ramp up in staffing and quite frankly, they want to start distributing money. So we looked at it as an opportunity to try to get in queue. Anybody else have any questions? And, and team for uh, this asking her group to maintain local control over this project. Let me tell you, that's a big deal. Yeah. It's a really big deal. Saves funding and uh, closer. It's not so like across the bridge, doing it right here. And that's excellent. Totally understand that and get it. That's good. Uh, Lisa, listen to your uh, presentation. The only two words I get out of it is start early. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dunn. I, I agree with Mr. Brown. These packets that we receive are so intricately detailed and break it down pages are numbered and I remember in the very beginning when I when we first started this I said I had no idea what all these acronyms stand for like I need a sheet and I had a sheet and they're written out and I knew what every single one of them stands for now I may not understand everything that you're putting together here but I tell you your team is doing a phenomenal job and I agree with Mr. Brown starting early on anything and under cost, we like those we like those words. Mr. Bowen, could Ms. Stashby give us an update on Beaver Run? Sure. Um, is there something specific we, you would like let, to know? Let's, let's approve this motion and then we'll do that. Is that okay? okay. Yeah. So if there are more questions about Mardella, then I assume you're ready to vote on the motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, carried. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ann. They went on a really nice tour of Beaver Run in the fall, but I haven't heard much since then. Could you give us just a brief update? Sure. Uh, they're making a lot of progress. Um, they're on schedule. Um, we're still within budget. So um, this coming uh, spring, the, it's scheduled for the administration team to move in in June as soon as school gets out, and then the kids will come back to that new building in August or September. Um, and then um, we'll have to take the old building down over in the summer and there'll be some phasing regarding site access to finish all the site improvements, which will wrap up at the end of the calendar year. So everything's good. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mrs. Ashby, for what you're doing to keep our schools get built on time and now maybe early. Thank you. Thank you. One more question since we're on the Beaver Run topic. Um, Mr. Murray and myself actually missed the Beaver Run tour. Um, and I don't know about him, but I am kind of like fighting at the bit to go around and check things out. So if we could maybe all work together and figure out what works for you, Miss Ashby. I would like to. Okay. I would love to check it out. I'll work with Dr. Stopper and Dr. Okay, perfect. She thank you so much. Plans for it. She already has plans. <laughs> well, Anything thank else? You. Nope. Right, thank thank you. you. 6.7 personnel matter. Personnel matters is for information only, but we did add 6.8 when we amended the agenda. So upon the recommendation of the superintendent, is there a motion to approve changes to the 2021-2022 uh, school calendar? Uh -huh. Is there a second? Second. I'll turn that over to Dr. Hamlin to explain. Poor Kim Miles. This is Miles. Okay, good evening. Once again. So, um, as you were aware, we have had four school day closures to this point in time, and those include January 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 7th, just last week. So, our current calendar, approved calendar, has three days built in for inclement weather makeup days. One of those has already passed. That was in December. There are two remaining, one of those being April 14th, the other being June 15th. 
That will be uh, coverage for two of the four required days. And also, I'm um, not sure if we can get it up on the screen if, if, if possible, but there's an additional makeup day proposed for January 31st, as well as June 16th. So again, in summary, four days that have to be rescheduled. Those would include April 14th, June 15th, already built into the calendar as inclement weather makeup days, January 13th, and June 16th. Obviously, there will be impact on marketing terms, so as a summary, term two, the current term, would end now on January 31st, was previously scheduled to end that preceding Friday, the 28th, so the new end date would be the 31st, and that would be provision for 43 days in term two. Term three, originally scheduled to end April 1, would end April 8, and that would be the provision for 48 total days for term three. Term four, our final term for the academic year, would now be proposed to end on June 16th. Originally, that last day was June 14th. Then June 16th as the final day, 46 days total, bringing us to the required 180 days for students. So to bring that all into focus, I can highlight the three months where there will be changes. If you look at the calendar, you'll see these in January 31st, will now be an early dismissal day. 28th will become a full day. Um, the 31st will be an early dismissal day. It was previously green on the calendar as a professional day. The afternoon will be provided um, for records management and the students would have an early dismissal. That's January's change. We can look at April. February and March have their changes in April. The first becomes a full day, previously early dismissal. The eighth becomes early dismissal, and the term three. Looking at the spring break, the 13th will now be a full day. The 14th, one of those built-in inclement weather days, will become the early dismissal day, and also report card distribution day. In June, Previously, the 10th and the 13th, uh, along with the 14th, were the early dismissal days, that traditional three final days school schedule. That will shift. Now the 14th, 15th, and 16th will be early dismissal days for students. The 16th now becomes the last day for students, instructional assistants, and nurses at the end of term four. And the 17th becomes the last day for teachers. So we are requesting uh, consideration for approval for this revised calendar. We do have a requirement in state regulations for 180 days of instruction for students, and this does allow us to meet that requirement. Dr. Hammond? Any questions for Dr. Hammond?
I, I do want to give you two words, and I want you to remember them. They're vulgarity and demeaning. And here's how I'm going to tie, tie this together. Uh, I was raised a Catholic. As a kid, I went to many catechism classes for my First Holy Communion and Confirmation. And my lessons were taught by the good sisters. And they taught us the lessons of Jesus and how he wanted us to leave our lives. And they gave us examples of how it affected our lives. Now, the sisters taught us really well, because I can tell you, even after 60-some years, I can remember all those lessons to this day. They're up here. And what I've learned during that time is in here, in my heart, and how they affect my life and everybody else's life. So the sisters taught me very well. Never in any of these classes that I attended did I hear any type, any of the materials I had, any words, anything we watched. Never, ever, was there any vulgarity or any demeaning words put out to the classes for the students to understand. Not once did anybody say, well, we've got to do this because it's, uh, the lesson is very important, so the end lesson is more important than what it takes to get there. I don't buy that. I can't buy it. I never will buy it. And I hope there's other people like that who, who will go along with that. Now, we have some problems, and I think it's in areas that we can, we can work it out. But the way we're going to have to do this, we're going to have to work together. And I'm asking everybody to work together to see if we can come with some answers to some of the problems that I see and what I've seen in the audience earlier. So uh, uh, that's all I have to say, Gene. Less than three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Mrs. Laird Lewis. You're going to go in order this time. You normally skip all around, so I wasn't prepared. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, I am absolutely thankful that we were able to make this happen. Um, I, as one of the board members who wanted to push to make sure that we had individuals come in that wanted to speak individuals that wanted to come in and sit in the back and listen, uh, take notes, and just be a support. Because like many of you know, there is support and power in numbers. Um, <clears throat> and I have two children in school, so I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, so the analogy um, that has been brought up tonight about not being able to get in and issues um, with you know lockdowns and things like that, I became anxious just sitting up here um, because I'm just that type of parent. So I appreciate everyone that came out tonight. I appreciate how smoothly the discussions went. Um, your topics, they're all written down. We have them. I wrote down, you know, the names. We will get a list of your names, your phone numbers. Um, all of our information is put out there for people to call us or email us. The majority of us as far as I know, we'll respond to emails and answer phone calls. So if there are people out there that want to call us and talk to us about things, feel free. That's why we're out there. We're elected individuals to be put in this position by taxpayers to call us, talk to us, get our opinion, right? get to know us so then you can know what we're for and what we want to do to enhance this county and make it the best county in the state of Maryland, because that's what we want to do. Um, so, as I said earlier, I like to read books. I really wish that the individual who had the two books, um, I just actually finished up um, one of the books that he played the um, small clip from. The other book, I did not get the name of that book, and that's what I was trying to ask you, Mr. Malone, was could I get the name of that book? Um, because I have not read that book. Um, and I would like to do so because I am reading all the books that are suggested or there seems to be a conflict with. Um, 
And then uh, December, you know, I enjoyed spending time with my family. I'm sorry I was unable to attend the November meeting. So to hear people talk about what occurred at that meeting, I was not there and I greatly apologize um, for that. Um, I helped at uh, Pittsville Elementary and Middle School sorting Fisher's popcorn. They did a Fisher's popcorn fundraiser. I must say that I indulged in the scratch and dent containers. Uh, because you can't send those home on a fundraiser, so we kind of just got to keep them and eat them while we work. So it was a wonderful payment method. Um, I agree with Mr. Palmer with the question and answer. I know that that has been mentioned numerous times with um, all of us together, and the question and answer, I think it's a phenomenal idea. Um, I believe it was Mr. Carlos. Wasn't yeah. sure how to pronounce the last name. I'm not sure the last name. <laughs> I, uh, I, okay, perfect. Well, that um, was a great suggestion. Um, I am 100% on board with that. I don't know how the other members feel, but um, I say let's do it. Let's make it happen. Um, and one question. So as I was sitting up here, I went on to the board website, and it said to watch live to click the link. Um, and I received eight emails and or text messages that it wasn't, it wasn't quite coming up. Um, so I'm not sure what happened with that, um, why it didn't say go to the YouTube page or whatever of that, but um, so I did actually go on and post that so that some of the schools would be able to know and parents would be able to know. But I really would like to see that um, fixed for next month's meeting if we're gonna do it swag it, then it says that, or if we're going to do it YouTube, it says YouTube, so that people just know um, where to go. We are, uh, during these times, we have a lot more people who want to be involved. We have a lot of, of people who are just learning how to maneuver and navigate through the website and technology and things like that, so I really think if we can make it user-friendly and put it out there to the public that it's going to be where it's going to be, how it's going to be there, and how to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murray? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to, a couple of things that I was going to comment on have already, believe it or not, but first is, so I want to thank uh, Ms. Wright and all the staff here. hosting this tonight. I greatly appreciate it. It's a wonderful opportunity for our parents, community, and all of us to come out. Second, I really appreciate the comments, as I always do, and I do comment on that, that I hear from parents, community members, that when they do comment. One thing I want to zero in on that is, and you also mentioned that yourself, Ms. Linda, that our email, our phone number, and it's all about it. And I have always returned when I get a text, email, or phone call within 24 hours. I may not sit there and answer the phone that minute, but I get back with people. So I encourage you if you have questions to call or concerns so that you can hear. Sure. <coughs> Next, um, I always enjoy the student reports as we get to hear some of the things that are happening in the schools that have happened and are going to happen. So I enjoy that. And um, actually, I'm just hoping that we don't have any more snow days this month because we have to look at this again. I think it's been very unusual last week, of course, starting it out. And that being said, again, I want to thank the people that came out and spoke to me. And thank you again for hosting us so we have ways to hear everyone. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Ms. Sadowski? First of all, I have two shout outs one to Mr. Jerry Kelly at the Horticulture Department and CTE who received his master's degree from UNES in December. My second shout out is to my fellow board members. I was approached by a Wicomico County teacher who asked me to publicly thank 
the board for the free half day that they gave the teachers. She wanted me to tell the board that it is greatly appreciated by the teachers, especially at her school, and she wanted the board to know. My second comment, I'm well known, Dr. Hammond, for all the questions which I send you each month. And I think you got my monthly questions probably earlier this week. One of the comments that I'm asking Dr. Hammond and Mr. Murray, you haven't been fortunate to get yours yet. But I've asked Dr. Hammond and Chairman Malone to see that a survey is sent out to students, teachers, and parents in grades five to nine about block scheduling. Now each month or several months now, we've heard from one parent who does not care for block scheduling. And yes, I have had comments from many other parents, students, and teachers, both positive and negative. I would say the comments I have heard have been even. So I think we need to have a survey to find out just how the feeling is across the spectrum and then see that if it is successful. On the internet this week, there was a general statement made that Wicomico County teachers did not have the materials in their classrooms because money was being wasted. This is a general statement with no details made. It was made to draw attention and to be sensational. I'm asking the person who posted this statement to email me tomorrow with teachers' names, the names of materials needed, better yet. I want the teachers to email me or call me and tell me what materials they need in their classroom that is not being provided. And I will report at the February board meeting on how many telephone calls or emails that I get. On another general statement that was made on the internet <coughs> yesterday is that there are thousands, thousands of invoices that show waste of millions, millions of dollars in the Wicomico County school system. Again, general statement, no details, being sensational. Being on the Board of Education is more than one meeting a month. It is daily readings and correspondence that is about 40 minutes a day. There is preparation, much reading, for the two committees that you serve on and meet each month. Looking forward to February alone, we have scheduled three extra meetings for budget, three meetings for superintendent search, about 30 to 35 hours each month is typical. For example, besides the meeting tonight, we have a BOE meeting tomorrow, and I have a committee meeting on Thursday. With daily readings, I will be devoted about 11 to 12 hours to my BOE position this week. We started out with a lot of people here this evening. Some of them have filed for school board. Some of them are thinking about it. But they didn't stay for the whole meeting. If you're elected to the school board, you can't get up and, and leave when you want to. So let's come to the meetings, but let's stay and hear the entire meeting. I'm through, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Ms. Sebastian. Mr. Graham? Uh, after the last snowstorm, as I was driving around town, I passed by several schools, in fact, five schools to be exact. And I was pleased to see that the sidewalks and the parking lot had been cleared so that we'd be ready for students and staff when they uh, return. That just goes to show you the value of all the uh, members of the uh, 
boys of Guantanamo took me out of school system because that, those things were done due to the efforts of the maintenance and custodial staff or whatever folks' names you want to give them, like environmental specialists, whatever they're called today. But they are equally as important as, as the teachers and administrative staff. And also, we are hearing a lot about uh, food service, and I think there was one school in Delmore, Delaware, that had to close early because food service were not there. So again, those people are very important to the process of educating our students each and every day. So I'd like to just say thank you to all those involved. Thank you to the administrators and staff. Also, with West Salisbury, this is a beautiful facility. And I'd like to thank Mrs. Wright and her administrative staff for allowing us to have this venue for our meeting. And as you can see, was able to accommodate what we had hoped it would in terms of individuals coming in and being able to talk. Um, on December 17, I had an opportunity to go to my last school and give it out dictionaries to the students of West, uh, West Side of the Media. And again, it's, I, this was the one school that I liked going to because one, I was the vice principal there, so I kind of connected to it. And I was able to talk to the kids, and I received some letters from them, not only the night, but I received them in the mail. And those kids really enjoy that book. It's not only a dictionary, but in the back of that dictionary, there's information about presidents, planets, and states, and uh, Braille, sign language, uh, the longest word in English language. The one thing that those kids enjoy doing is looking at the back of it, more so than looking at words, but looking at the back of it for different kinds of information. And each year, it's really rewarding to see that happen. This year, we were able to give about uh, 2,505 books out because we had to do both third and fourth grade because we missed uh, uh, third, uh, third grade last year, which would be fourth grade this year. And uh, another thing that was interesting to hear the student representatives uh, even though we've had a short period of time between the last meeting and now, is to see that these kids are having success in the activities, not only in the instructional piece, but the activities that are going on in the schools. And it's pleasing to see that the seniors, which was there last year or this year, are having success and are having somewhat of a normal school year as opposed to what it has been in the past. So again, I just want to say, Thanks to everyone that's involved, whether you be a parent uh, or a support staff member or administrative staff member, for all that you do for our kids. And just remember, during these challenging times, uh, all I have to say to you, you know, hang in there, this too will pass. Thank you, Mr. Brown. So I think I've made some comments after public comments, which probably should have been under board reports, so uh, I won't go through those again. But. All my colleagues have thanked the public for being here, and we do appreciate that. And it's, it's very healthy for us to hear from the public, and we appreciate your support. Ms. Sotowski's point, uh, the ones who have hung around to the bitter end, I see Mr. Hayes still here. There's others still here, so thank you very much for your support and continuing to listen to us. But meetings like this are very important, but they don't happen without people like Andrea Dooling, Tracy Saylor, Bob Langan, Paul Butler, and all the staff who spent hours here getting this set up uh, probably yesterday and today. So thank you all. So a round of applause for you guys. Because honestly, we don't, uh, this doesn't happen without them. So I walk in tonight, my laptop set up, the book's there. Andrea says, sign this, sign this, do this, do this. So, you know. <laughs> Without those folks, this thing just doesn't come to pass, and we appreciate it very much. So, to wrap this evening up and kind of put a bow on it, we again thank everyone for being here. Um, we thank the public, and we thank all our teachers and support staff who are fighting this pandemic day after day and teaching our kids in school. And we are making every effort, as Dr. Hanlon said, and our plan is to make every effort to keep the schools open. Thank you to, and you can't say it enough to the teachers, staff, principals, everyone who are fighting this thing every day and going to work. Um, we appreciate what you do, and we appreciate the public and what you do as parents. And with that, we're adjourned. Safe travels home. Thank you.